with the subcommittee at today's hearings and ask questions. Without objection, so ordered. As a reminder, please keep your microphone muted unless speaking. Should I hear any inadvertent background noise, I will request that the member please mute their microphone. To insert a document into the record, please have your staff email it to documentsti at mail.house.gov. So good morning. <clears throat> this subcommittee um, works towards reauthorization of the Surface Transportation Board. Today, we have an opportunity to hear from members of the board to determine what additional authorities are needed to improve rail service across the country. The STB is a unique independent agency that is the primary economic regulator of freight railroads, responsible for ensuring that the railroads honor their common carrier obligations. Shippers play a critical role in the national supply chain by making, making the food we eat, ensuring the water that we drink is safe, providing, elec providing electricity, and providing building materials. We held a hearing with stakeholders two months ago who sounded the alarm on the rail service issues and to get their ideas for reauthorization. Recently, the STB held two days of emergency public testimony on the meltdown of our nation's freight rail operations. The STB heard from many shippers, labor leaders, and even Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg and um, Agriculture, Agriculture Deputy Secretary um, Bruno on the significant delays in transporting cargo by freight rail. Chemical shippers are enduring 78% longer transit times and service days have been cut nearly in half. Agriculture producers such as soybean and rice have seen a particularly sharp decline in the quality of freight rail service. The National Grain and Feed Association recently wrote to this subcommittee explaining that, and I quote, the current inability of several class one carriers to provide reliable rail service to, the customer, to their customers is impacting farm gate commodity prices and elevating food prices for customers. Increasing prices for our food gas prices at the pump, turning on our lights, and having safe drinking water is crucial. These are all impacted by increasing delays in freight rail service. Quite frankly, this is unacceptable. The timely and efficient movement of goods remains of paramount importance to a strong economy. I understand that Class I freight railroad's explanation of the decline in service is due to several factors, including workforce shortage. <clears throat> what, what is maddening is that the very workforce shortage contributing to the decline in service is a result of the class, of the class is implementing precision uh, scheduled railroading, or PSR. <clears throat> Excuse me. By the end of last year, the Class I railroad workforce was cut by nearly a third compared to 2015. Those cuts began years before the pandemic hit. And despite knowing it takes a number of months to return qualified workers to the rails, the railroad doubled down by cutting again in 2020. I've been concerned to hear from workers and their unions about employees being overworked and rushed on the job. Now, the worsening working conditions, years of job insecurity, and the months 
required to properly train workers before they can return to service have come home to roost in the form of severe hiring challenges the railroads currently face. All of this is why the STB held the emergency hearing. Last week, the STB unanimously acted to require the largest railroads, UP, BNSF, CSX, and NS, to develop service recovery plans to improve service and metrics to measure progress, including goals and measures for rail service performance and employment training and hiring levels. Stakeholders have also proposed new authorities, such as expanding the STB's ability to assess fines or allow for reverse delay char charges that shippers can charge carriers. I look forward to the hearing board members' views on the stakeholder proposals and their own proposals. I now recognize Mr. Crawford for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you for holding this hearing today, and for the witnesses, thank you for being here today as well. Today's hearing will be the first time all five Surface Transportation Board members have appeared before the committee. We'll hear about their work and thoughts on a potential STB reauthorization. The STB is an independent agency created in 1996. It's only been reauthorized one time, that was back in 2015 when changes were made to ensure that STB operated more effectively, including expanding the board from three to five members. This year, the STB is busier than ever as it reviews several major proposed rulemakings, a major merger between two class one freight railroads and potential expansion of Amtrak service. The STB recently held a two day hearing where it examined service issues involving freight railroad carriers and shippers. The STB heard testimony from several stakeholders on their concerns about the state of the industry and potential solutions. Some of these freight service issues have arisen in my district, prompting me to submit a letter to the STB, expressing my concerns and hopes that the STB can work with shippers and freight carriers to resolve these problems. When broadly looking at a potential STB reauthorization, we must carefully and deliberately, deliberately examine the board's needs, ensure that any proposals have a positive long-term impact on the STB's operations, and we must not interfere with, slow down, or distract from the STB's current duties and their abundant workload. I commend the chair for holding this hearing today and look forward to hearing from our witnesses. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Now uh, hear from the chairman of the full committee, Mr. DeFazio. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for this critical hearing. Thanks uh, to members of the Service Transportation Board uh, for being here. Thanks for your service. Uh, but we are at a point of crisis, uh, and we have to deal with that crisis meaningfully. Uh, the facts are undeniable. Freight service in the United States of America, which used to have the best freight rail in the world, is abysmal. Uh, shippers are being impacted by poor rail service. Uh, they're, they're shifting to trucking. Uh, of course, that's more greenhouse gas pollution. Raw material delays have actually shut factories. Uh, extra labor costs to load and unload once rail cars arrive. This service is you know, forcing shippers to recoup their losses or the manufacturers downstream, and that's the consumers. So this is contributing to the inflationary spike in this country. The evil ghost of Hunter Harrison lives on. The legacy of this man is disgusting. What he did, he has addicted the CEOs of the rail industry to watching the ticker on Wall Street and using their resources to benefit their shareholders and not run railroads like railroads. This isn't the only industry that's been infected. Boeing killed people because of the same pressure and the same infection. And it's gotta stop. And you are the people who can stop it with the freight rail industry. The, the freight railroad uh, CEOs say, poor service. It's not, had nothing to do with us. Oh no, no, it's COVID supply chain. Oh, that their workforce. Oh, by the way, you laid off one hell of a lot of your workforce, and a lot of them are coming back to you because they've been, they have been disrespected, mistreated, and you've made it more dangerous for your workers with these cuts. 
you know, you're not looking to change. I'm talking to the CEOs now. You're not looking to change. You know, you're just bringing in, raking in record profits. Whoa, more dividends for shareholders. And oh, hey, by the way, my salary also goes up and my stock goes up. Isn't that great? Well, the country suffers. You know, I've been talking about this for a long time. And people say, oh, that's just DeFazio carrying on. Well, now it's DeFazio joined with some very unlikely allies. That would be the chemical industry, the energy industry, the agriculture industry, uh, and a whole host of other shippers uh, who are bemoaning what has been done, the destruction that has been wrought on freight rail in America with so-called precision scheduled railroading. You know, I, I don't have much in common with the oil industry. We don't agree on much of anything. But here's a quote from the American Fuel and Petrochemical Manufacturers testimony. And I hope the Republicans are listening because you're just listening to the damn freight railroads. Listen to your constituents and look at what it's doing to them. Consolidation in the railroad industry has created a system of regional duopolies. And the railroad's understandable desire to maximize profits has come into conflict with railroads' common carrier obligation. The Staggers Act was not intended to make the railroads attractive investment targets on Wall Street. It was designed to meet the demands of interstate commerce and national defense. PSR, precision scheduled railroading, has interfered with those goals. It's a business model, cuts expenses to the bone, slows customer service, volume growth. Uh, the freight railroads only want to take now the most profitable freight. They're not going to spend anything on growing or maintaining their businesses because, you know, that might hurt their stock price if they actually looked to the future and made investments. Surplus assets are mothballed, workers furloughed, and, uh, you know, but they're getting short-term profits. That's great. Uh, you don't have to take my word for it again. Um, former Burlington Northern Santa Fe CEO Matt Rose. Uh, he left a great legacy, which is now being dismantled over there, too, which is sad that BNSF is following, um, you know, Hunter Harrison. The street, this is Matt Rose. This is his exit uh, op-ed, essentially, from the industry. The street, I'm talking about sell-side analysts, has been extremely aggressive with the publicly traded railroads. They're saying that less is better. Less capital is better. Fewer market opportunities are better. Fewer unit trains are better. It's all about lowering the operating ratio. I disagree with almost all of that. I truly believe that every industry, every business needs growth. I just don't think you can shrink yourself into a virtuous cycle model that works. That's Matt Rose, former CEO of BNSF. Now, I'm pleased that you're taking the matter seriously. I'm pleased you held a hearing, uh, but uh, you know, We've got to act more decisively and more quickly, and you need to do that because you have to protect the railroad network in this country. It's a vital asset. It's going to be critical uh, not only for supply chain issues but for the future in terms of dealing with climate change, moving freight much more effectively and with much less pollution than, than trucks. Um, and, you know, your testimony asks for virtually nothing from this committee. Uh, suggesting you have all the powers you need. Well, if that's true, and I'm not sure it is, then use them. Use them. You know, some will argue, oh, it's a free market problem. It'll be resolved by the markets. But that doesn't work with duopolies or monopolies. It does not work. In fact, that's the reason you exist. That is the whole reason that you exist. Current law lays out your responsibilities. I'm not going to go through all of them. But you know what they are. But they include maintaining reasonable rates, fair wages, prohibit predatory pricing, meet the needs of public and national defense, ensure the development and continuation of the sound rail transportation system. That isn't happening in America today. It's not happening. We're going downhill here really quickly. So you're not there to protect the bottom line of these railroads and the CEO's bonuses. You know, you're not there even for the, the shippers bottom line, but you are there to make this system work better, keep the costs lower, and uh, be competitive. There's very little competition. 
We need to reinstill competition here. So let me be crystal clear. If you don't move decisively uh, and don't rise to this occasion, which is a looming crisis, and I just talked to the White House Economic Advisor about this last night. Uh, they're well aware of it. They are extraordinarily concerned. They're looking what steps they can take by executive order to deal with this mess that's being created by the leeches on Wall Street and the obeisance of these CEOs uh, running these companies into the ground. Uh, I want freight railroads to be successful. I do. You know, but that success should be defined by the amount of freight they move across the nation, uh, the amount of greenhouse gas they prevent, and the safety of their employees and communities they traverse. So I urge you to incentivize the railroads to act like Wall Street, not Wall Street cash cows, not pawns of those leeches on Wall Street. Stock buybacks, dividends can't be the measures for success of freight rail in this country. They are the only mode with a continued decline in volume in a time of shipping uh, crisis in this nation and high inflation. You've got to do something about it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank the chairman. Uh, now, I would like to welcome our witnesses. Uh, first, we have Martin Oberman, chairman of the Surface Transportation Board, uh, Michelle Schultz, vice chair, Surface Transportation Board, and Surface Transportation Board members Patrick Fuchs, Robert Primus, and Karen Hedlund. Hedlund. Uh, thank you for joining us today, and I look forward to your testimony. Chairman Overman uh, will testify on behalf of the entire Surface Transportation Board, but all five members are available for questions. Without objection, our witnesses' full statements will be included in the record. Uh, since your written testimony has been made a part of the record, subcommittee requests that you limit your oral testimony to five minutes. Chairman Overman, you may proceed. Thank you, and uh, good morning, uh, Chairman DeFazio, Chairman Payne, Ranking Member Crawford, and distinguished members of the committee and subcommittee. Uh, as chairman of the STB and on behalf of my fellow board members, Thank you for the opportunity to offer our views on agency reauthorization. I will say at the outset that our five-member board has evolved into an extraordinarily collegial and effective group which strives hard to act by consensus and generally has succeeded in doing so. Rail network reliability is essential to the nation's economy and is my top priority. The industry is now facing a severe crisis in service as described by even one Wall Street analyst description which, in my view, is all too accurate. I was designated chairman by President Biden in January 2021. One of my first initiatives was to focus on the freight <clears throat> network with particular attention on congestion in the intermodal supply chain. Shortly after becoming chairman, I sent letters to the CEOs of all Class Ones asking them to report on their preparedness to meet growing demand for rail service as freight volumes rebounded. In response, they all provided assurances and expressed confidence they could handle freight volume as the economy continued its recovery. They were wrong. Instead, the rail industry clearly is struggling to provide adequate and reliable rail service. Why? Over the last six years, the Class I railroads have cut their workforce by 29 percent for a loss of 45,000 employees. With demand back and against the backdrop of these significant cuts and other changes, they face major holes in their service. The severity of the problem has necessitated immediate board action. Two weeks ago, the board held public hearings which revealed beyond any debate that rail service is unacceptably poor with acute issues in many regions. It is clear that the four largest railroads' earlier assurances about having sufficient employees, locomotives, and rail cars it were incorrect. All stakeholders agree the problem is principally caused by a shortage of labor. That shortage started with the huge pre-pandemic cuts. Then in the spring of 2020, at the onset of the pandemic, the same railroads cut their already reduced labor forces even more, <clears throat> excuse me, by as much as an additional 20 percent. As demand for freight rail service quickly rebounded, many of the previously laid off workers found other careers. And as the railroads admit, they are now having difficulty recruiting and training employees. 
Rail labor reports particular difficulty directly caused by increased job uncertainty, worsened working conditions, and insufficient incentives. Given these challenges, I am not optimistic about significant improvement in service in the near term. What is clear is that the railroad industry cannot thrive without redundancy. They must maintain a workforce and equipment, particularly locomotives, at a level which provides an essential cushion to meet all the variable but not unforeseeable contingencies. When they fail to do so, then ultimately not only will they suffer, but even worse, their customers and the public suffers more. What could not be more clear is that the railroads do not have sufficient redundancy. Two weeks ago, the board issued a proposed rule to improve our process to provide relief in times of emergency. As a follow-up to our rail service hearing last week, we issued an order focusing the industry's attention on the urgent need to restore reliable service. The details of that order are in my written testimony. In addition, this past March, we held a hearing to work on updating the reciprocal switching rules. In my view, reciprocal switching can improve rail service by enhancing competition, and I personally hope the board will act on it before this year is out. We've also advanced two proposed rulemakings to reform our rate review process. A streamlined new idea called for, uh, for the U.S. called Final Offer, and a rule to establish a voluntary and binding arbitration process. It is also my intention that we will act on these two rules by this fall. The board has a number of tools in its existing statutory arsenal to enhance service. To be sure, and to be fair to some of my colleagues, not everyone on the board agrees on the exact scope of that authority. But in my view, the board can use its existing authority to mitigate these problems in a meaningful way. And because my time is about up, I do want to just jump quickly to point out that we are establishing a new office to handle our new responsibility to enforce on-time performance in the passenger area, which will be uh, up and running, and we will be able to handle any new on-time performance cases that are brought to us. Uh, with that, I see my time is up, and I can elaborate on these points in, in answer to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we will now move on to um, questions, and I will um, recognize each member will be recognized for five minutes. And I will start by recognizing the chairman of the full committee, Chairman DeFazio. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, rail labor um, and shippers really haven't agreed on many things, but they both recommend that. Uh, there, we do a better job of defining a carry and common carrier obligation. Um, so, you know, given uh, what the chair just said about the abysmal service, um, you know, the fact that we're forcing shippers to accept less service, not showing up, uh, is the common carrier language too vague uh, to prevent uh, these reductions in service? Because we can redefine what it means. That's really a, a, the topic of, of the day, in, in my view, to some degree, uh, Chairman. The common carrier language in the statute is general, but we have authority by rulemaking to define it more specifically. But I will tell you, as a lawyer who's done a lot of drafting in my time myself, there are so many variables in how rate, uh, shippers and customers get their service from railroads trying to come up with rulemaking language that would be enforceable in court and covers uh, the variety of situations has been a task. I've been struggling okay, with it. Then maybe and I we, think this then, Congress is then, struggling Then you with. think perhaps we need to specify. Well, I think either you or us could. I think okay. we have the authority well, I, to. But I mean, when I hear, you know, you might you hope to get something done by the end of the year, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't help me much here. I'm, I feel much more of a sense of urgency. So. I'm, you know, I, this is really pointing toward the committee in your reauthorization to take action. I, I would be, I would be wel welcome that, Mr. Chairman, and I would be happy to have me and our staff work with your experts to try to come up with those definitions. I think it's a, ch it's a legal challenge, but I think it's needed. I agree with you. Great. That's good. Um, and I'm going to ask a member, uh, Primus, about this, this one. I mean, you know, we all know about inflation uh, across the economy. I already talked about how, um, you know, what's happening on with freight rail is, is uh, increasing costs for manufacturers, shippers, and others, and they're passing it on to consumers. 
The UP just announced $25 billion in stock buybacks. So we know how much that's worth uh, to the CEO in his salary. I really wonder. Norfolk Southern, $10 billion. CSX, 7% hike uh, in its dividend. And BNSF uh, is doing very well for Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, do, can you suggest something we can deal with this egregious behavior by these people? Thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Chairman. It's good to see you again. Yeah, I, I have the same concerns as you. Uh, I look at the first quarter of this year and, and the service degradation, uh, and instead of you know, immediately after that quarter talking about how they're going to fix the service to their, to their customers, uh, or how they're going to address the concerns of their employ employees, uh, they turned around and gave uh, billions of dollars of, uh, uh, in stock buybacks to, to uh, investors who probably won't invest back into the, into the network, especially when we need more investment in the network at this moment. Uh, th their capital uh, expenditures or their investment in the network is, is far less than their uh, uh, dividends or, or their buybacks that they're, they're giving these shareholders. And I think there's, uh, there has to be a refocus of priority. I think if there's anything that, that uh, you know, we need to look at or need help on is, is uh, these, these activist investors, these hedge funds that come in only for short-term gain, uh, you can see it clearly. It's, uh, it's played out uh, for the last several years. Uh, this is not the same investment group uh, that the railroads have, have had in the past who understand that in order to run a railroad correctly, there has to be long-term growth, long-term investment, long-term uh, interest. And I think you see that now. Okay. Uh, well, uh, you, if you, you have that. any suggestions afterwards, I'd, I'd just like to ask one more question of uh, Board Member Hedlund about uh, passenger rail service. There was some reference to it. I know the board is looking at action. Uh, you know, it's pretty clear in the law uh, when we took over the obligation to carry passengers uh, from the railroads uh, that Amtrak is supposed to get preference, and of course they don't. Uh, and it's been litigated many times by the industry. Uh, do you have the? What can we do there, or what do you think should be done there? It, I don't think your mic is. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, you know, we now have authority to uh, examine on time performance, uh, which will, of course, implicate the issue of whether the railroads are giving them preference. Uh, and we expect we're going to get a case fairly soon, given uh, the on-time performance percentages that Amtrak has reported for the last uh, two quarters of the last year. Um, there was only one uh, long-distance line that was above 80%. The rest were well below. Uh, some of the shorter lines are above 80%, but the long-distance lines do not perform well. Uh, and uh, we need to look into that to see whether, um, uh, you know, one of, one of the issues that uh, has come up is uh, long trains. And uh, they're running trains that are longer than their sidings. So when there is a three-mile long train in front of a little Amtrak train, the three-mile long train may not be able to uh, uh, get out of the way for many, many, many miles. So that is something that I look forward to, uh, uh, to uh, examining. Thank you. And just one quick comment, Mr. Chairman, that'll be done. I mean, yes, my state actually partnered with Union Pacific, I hope they're listening, uh, to do more sidings between uh, Eugene and Portland, where uh, we have trains that can run faster than the freight track can handle, um, but it takes three hours or more to go 112 miles. Right. Uh, and that's because their trains are now longer than the sidings, which was a joint investment, which is pretty sad. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, now recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Crawford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to direct this to uh, Chair Overman. Um, the Biden administration has advocated for many policies to increase competition, improve safety, reduce emissions, and the board's considered those goals when moving forward with regulations. However, overlaid on top of those efforts have been significant disruptions to our nation's supply chain. I think it's important to remember that the supply chain is an extremely complex system and regulations can impose significant operational disruptions to the freight transportation sector. 
Mr. Chairman, would you commit today to ensuring that the board fully considers the impact of any potential regulations or determinations on the supply chain before taking any action? We, of course, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Congressman, uh, we, of course, do that every time we consider a regulation. But I have heard this argument made, and I want to have the opportunity in answering to your question to tell you that the railroads could not possibly have screwed up the system any more than they're doing on their own. There's nothing we could do to make it worse right now. It is in terrible shape, as has been indicated by members of the committee and, and by everything we heard at our hearing. Uh, but everything we are doing, and one reason that it t takes some time for us to carefully enact regulations, is to do just what you said, to make sure that w if we're going to enact new regulations, such as reciprocal switching, it is done with care to solve the problems and not create them. But a lot of what we hear from the railroads, in my view, are just uh, excuses for what's, what they're doing inadequately. But yes, of course, we will make, we have that commitment, so it's easy for me to give you that assurance. All right, the STB has expressed concern with competition in the rail industry. However, the last update to the study of competition in the U.S. freight rail industry commissioned by the board was completed in 2010. The dynamics of the industry's markets um, that the railroads serve have changed significantly over the past 12 years. Would each of you support the board updating that study? Well, let me, let me address that. Uh, we are, I always welcome more data, more research. It's always helpful. But I do not need a study to know that there is woefully lacking competition in the okay, rail industry. I, I, I get that, Mr. Chairman. You've made that point abundantly clear. But I'm asking a question. Would you support updating that 12-year-old study? Sure. There's no reason not to. It will give us more information. But it, okay. we don't and, need and a study. And you've also indicated have. in your testimony that you have a, a spirit of collegiality among the board members. And so it's safe to say that the board would agree uh, across, across the board that they would support uh, an update to that study as well? You know, one of the ways I've achieved that collegiality is to make sure they all get a chance to speak for themselves. So I will let them address you. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Mr. Primus, do so you want to go first? We'll just move from right to left, left to right, as the case may be. Uh, yes, the, uh, my answer is yes. Thank you. Yes, as well. Thank you. Yes, Ranking Member Crawford. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Gentleman yields back. I'll now recognize myself for questions. Uh, Chairman Overman, I'm, I'm deeply troubled by uh, testimony I heard from both our hearing last month and the STB's recent hearing on freight rail service in the country. Uh, I'm aware that the STB recently took emergency action to require railroads to submit plans uh, to recover service and report information. Can you elaborate on on what concern concerned you the most from the testimony you heard? It'd be take a long time to tell you everything that concerned me the most. Uh, it was very, very troubling. But it does boil down to the pressures that the railroads that Chairman DeFazio alluded to to cut cut resources. They've cut labor to below the bone, really. They've cut, they have thousands of locomotives. They've mothballed, which, which uh, slows down trains, involves less locomotives to move trains when they need to, to, need to be moved. That's the big picture. That's, that's the overview, and it concerns me the most. And what sort of exacerbates the problem, in my view, is that we have been hearing, and I've heard since I've been on the board, but more intensely in the last year, uh, reports from rail labor that in order to, in my view, what's happening is in order to make up for the shortage of labor, they are overworking and abusing the workforces they have. Now, not enough days off, uh, sudden announcements of their assignments and so forth. And so they are forcing an unusually, uh, uh, a larger than usual number of people, long-term employees literally leaving. So you're not only a shortage of workers, but you're losing a tremendous amount of institutional knowledge. So I think that's the focus of it. There are lots of parts of it, but that's what really concerns me the most, this overview 
the pressure that the railroads feel, and you could argue whether the pressure is only from outside from Wall Street or it's internal in the C-suites. I think it's joint. Uh, uh, that they've realized there's a way they, they can uh, make short-term profits at the, at the expense of the public. Okay. And um, how did that inform the board's unanimous decision to require corrective action? I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I didn't hear the question. I said, how did that inform the board's unanimous decision to require corrective actions? Well, it certainly eliminated any debate amongst the, uh, us that that strong corrective action was needed, and we acted for the board with lightning speed by issuing an order just, uh, I think, a, a week or so, 10 days after that hearing. Uh, the details are, are we submitted to you in, in the order, but it is very far-reaching in terms of requiring <clears throat> much more detailed reporting of on-time performance, uh, which we've never really had, and we had been working on a longer-term rule, which we're still working on, but we mm -hmm. felt we couldn't wait. So we are requiring a certain amount of, of first-mile, last-mile reporting immediately, uh, and we have ordered the four big U.S. railroads to give us uh, recovery plans with, and within, I think, two weeks. I can't remember the time frame in front of me, and then report to our staff every two weeks over the next few months so we can monitor their progress. Okay. Um, and um, I want to ask the question, um, can everyone quickly highlight what um, concerned them from the hearing? And let's begin with Vice Chair Schultz. Um, thank you for as the As quickly question. as you can. As quickly as I can. Um, yeah, just to echo uh, Chairman Oberman's comments, um, there were so many um, issues brought to our attention. They were all incredibly important. Um, what comes to mind immediately uh, were the challenges that I believe that the agricultural products industry as well as the en energy industries are experiencing at this time and the impact that that's having on, on uh, other areas of the supply chain. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Hedlund? Um, when I joined this board in January, I never thought that I would be worrying about whether we'd be able to export enough grain to make up for the reduction to the world market in grain caused by uh, the war in Ukraine. Uh, but that's where we are. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Fuchs? I would say, Mr. Chairman, first, last mile service failures. Uh, these are missed switches. This is just before a shipper or receiver is about to receive their freight, and so it has a disproportionate impact on their operations. Um, so th that includes first last mile service failures for both grain and energy, but across the entire network. That's what concerns me most. Thank you. Mr. Primus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would say that uh, I've been alarmed at just how comprehensive uh, the service failures have uh, become. It's not limited to region, it's not limited to one industry or one area, it is widespread. I think it is a, a national crisis, a national emergency. I think it's a national security emergency. You, uh, you look at food prices going up, you look at uh, the cost of energy, uh, even coal to our uh, uh, coal-fired power plants. Uh, you're looking at uh, uh, chemicals to water treatment plants, shortages there. I think across the board, uh, we're in trouble. And I think that uh, um, we really got to raise this to, to, a, to a level to, to address that. Thank you. Uh, my time has expired. I will now hear um, from Mr. Burchett for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to be brief as well. Um, Mr. Oberman, freight transportation bottlenecks, they seem to continue to disrupt our national supply chains. I wonder how, how have these uh, federal mandates improved or worsened the crisis? And also, do you foresee any recent regulatory changes negatively affecting rail freight operations in the future? I, I'm not sure which uh, changes, Congressman, you're talking about in terms of the bottlenecks. Well, it, it seems that every, every day I pick up a paper, there's, there's uh, supply chain issues, and I know that a large amount of freight has traveled across our rails, and I'm wondering, do those, um, are the man, are any, are any federal mandates, have they improved, or have they, or have they caused problems with it? 
Well, I, I'm not aware of any federal mandate that's causing problems. Uh, the okay. lack of mandates, I think, over the last 40 years has enabled the railroads to get to the point they're at. Uh, there were great advantages to the Staggers Act when it was enacted and for the next 20, 25 years. But the Staggers Act put, you know, eliminated a great many of what had been, probably, uh, I think we all agree, over-regulation. Uh, but in my view, what's happened in the system is that the pendulum has swung too far. And once the major railroads were allowed to consolidate, which, which had many good aspects to it in the 90s, it enabled ultimately a situation I think the Chairman DeFazio described as monopolistic and duopolistic. And so by the early 2000s, those railroads have began to exercise that monopoly power, which has really brought us to the place where we are today. So, so, so you're so, thinking, so, you, right on that line of thinking, are you thinking that we need more regulations on railroads to improve their, their service? The way I look at it, Congressman, <coughs> is that we need to change the incentives. And what I have preached since I have been on the board and certainly since I've been chairman is that I would rather the railroads solve these problems on their own so we do not have to intervene. But clearly the incentives right now are weighed much more heavily in, in incentivizing the railroads to cut resources. So we need to do things, for example, if we set, if we could, as Chairman DeFazio was questioning, put some detailed service standards in the common carrier obligation as an example, that's one tool, to say, look, you have to meet these standards. I, I have said, if you can do it with an OR of 50, I don't really care what your OR is, but you've got to have decent service. I don't think you can do it with an OR that low because it means you don't have enough workers. So, but, it, but I, to me, the way to go is to change the incentives and not try to micromanage how they operate the actual railroad, but just say, meet these standards, and then you're fine. And do you think that's possible without any additional regulations, or do you think that's you think they're just you're putting them on the honor system? But if they don't, you're going to pop them. Is that what I understand? You know, I've been around too long, Congressman, to put anybody on the honor system totally when there's that much money floating around on Wall Street. It's just too powerful for all of us humans, uh, and I include myself in, in that remark. So we do need to take some action. I think, and uh, the board is working mightily in this direction. I can't. Uh, speak for what the outcome is, that a regulation which permits, doesn't mandate, but permits reciprocal switching will bring more competition. For example, I think by making rate relief easier to obtain, because right now there basically isn't rate, even though we have the authority to regulate uh, review rates, nobody brings rate cases, they cost millions of dollars and take years. And there are clearly cases where people are entitled to them. Those will incentivize, I think, the railroads and shippers to reach their own agreements if they know we stand there without our having to intervene. That's the hope. Um, but I do think we need to do more. One, uh, one way would be, and it is something that has very much been on my mind, but in all honesty, I haven't figured out the solution. If I had, I would have brought it to you, is to put more specifics into the common carrier obligation. But beyond that, and I've given this a lot of thought, particularly getting ready for this hearing, that the broad economic forces that Chairman DeFazio spoke of are really matters of such fundamental business policy in this country. Uh, they're beyond what this board was set up to do. And you wouldn't want, I don't think, our board to be telling Wall Street how to behave. I think there's a place for the Congress to be reviewing that, but you wouldn't want to regulate stocks in just one industry. If there's a problem, I think we may need to rethink it and re-examine it as a country. And I'd certainly welcome the chance to contribute our little corner of the world. It's not so little, but our, our corner of it. But it may, it may require that because, as has been mentioned, while the railroads, because of their monopolistic ability, are a particularly egregious area right now, there are other areas of the business community which we may need to be thinking about. I've run over my time. Thank you, Mr. Sorry, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, so thank I. you. Thank you. Mr. Balderson, thank you, Brett. Um, next, we will hear from the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cohen, for five minutes. I'm unmuted now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate your having this hearing. And it's an honor to follow Mr. Burchett, and I might have some time to lend them into my 
questions. But first, Mr. Uh, Oberman, I want to thank you for appearing before us. Um, I, I, I really appreciated Mr. DeFazio's uh, comments. He's uh, passionate, and, and apparently there are problems within the uh, freight industry uh, that uh, the employees seem to be having and that the industry seems to be having. Uh, but my concern is uh, that I continue to hear from rail employees in, in my district, and my district has several uh, class one railroads going through it, uh, including the BNSF. BNSF. Uh, but they continue writing me about increasing difficulty that, that they have on, on the job. Uh, you discussed severe job cutting on the class ones that 45,000 jobs or 29% of the industry in just a few short years. Demands on employees that remain uh, uh, have only increased, including the deployment of high vis attendance policy at the BNSF. This policy and others like it put incredible strain on employees, making it difficult, if not impossible, to take time off for doctor's appointments, care for sick children or loved ones, or even rest when an employee knows that they're too fatigued to work safely. These unreasonable restrict expectations are driving people out of the industry at a time when we're all hearing about the need to staff up the railroads. Uh, so what I'm, do you believe the imposition of conditions like high vis are ultimately having an impact on the ability of railroads to deliver good services? You know, somebody slammed the door just as you asked the question, Congressman. Could you just state the last question again? Was it somebody from BNSF? <laughs> I, only caught, they I only caught the back of their head as they went out of the room, so I can't answer. Thank you, sir. I was asking about the high vis uh, program that they've got, and one of the employees who's written me a constituent with a very touching letter that I wasn't going to ask any questions at all. But his letter was so touching, I thought I needed to, to, to ask on his behalf. He's about, he's a 13-year retired vet. He's got twins. He loves working for, for BNSF, but he, they, he's been having trouble getting time off to do doctor's appointments and take care of his health. And I wondered if you think high vis is the problem in, in, in help stopping railroads from delivering the good services that they, could, that they should be doing. Well, it's not the problem, but I have received many, many of the same kinds of letters that you just described. And we heard from rail labor at our hearing uh, two weeks ago. And uh, I don't think BNSF is unique. They all have a different name for how they are uh, treating their employees. But I think this effort to squeeze more work uh, out of a smaller and smaller number of, work, of workers has become extremely impressive and is forcing, as I mentioned earlier, a number of people to just leave the industry some in, in mid-career leaving their uh, pensions on the table. It's really quite remarkable. Uh, so I think it is a symbolic of the problem. Uh, uh, and I, you, you know, the uh, RTP, the Rail Transportation Policy, says uh, that we are generally to make sure that there are fair wages or, or good uh, treatment of labor. But we really do not have jurisdiction over rail labor. There are other agencies specifically set up to deal with that. And of course, there's a national bargaining session going on right now, and one would hope uh, that rail, class one railroads are getting the message. I would note, Congressman, uh, and I don't want to concede too much at this point because uh, it, it was just the beginning, but two days ago, Jim Foote, who's CEO of CSX, made a, gave a relatively remarkable statement, in my view, that I read a, an account of in yesterday's press, uh, saying that it was time for the class ones to completely rethink their relationships with labor, that they know they have problems. Uh, now, that was good rhetoric. It remains to be seen if there's any meat behind that rhetoric. Uh, but maybe there, we're, all of us who are engaged in this area, including the members of this committee, are beginning to get their attention. I would hope so. Well, thank you, Mr. Auburn. I realize there are other, other agencies that deal with labor, but you're the closest uh, opportunity I had to raise this issue. And the only thing that I really wanted to talk about, didn't really want to talk about anything, but this was just too much. And this, um, Mr. Smithers, we contacted us back from BNSF about this particular employee. Uh, it was about a, a month after we contacted him. And uh, the letter's rather uh, vanilla. And uh, uh, maybe we'll try again, or BNSF will help me. I mean, I just, I was just touched by this man's letter. He's an older man. He's working as an engineer and he gave 13 years to, to our government and the, the defense industry and he came home to be with his twins and and he's got health problems and he wants to stay on it seems like they should take they're doing the minimum which the federal government requires on fmla and some other things 
but they ought to be doing more than the minimum to, to bolster their workforce, care for their employees, and to, and to help the rail industry in general. So, you know, we'll try to do that. Now, do, I, do, I, do I have any time left? Uh, gentlemen's time has expired. Well, I'll lend, I'll lend that time to Mr. Burchett, and I thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, the chair now recognizes um, Mr. Bost for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Oberman, uh, over the last six months, the board has held two-day hearings on reciprocal switching, a two-day hearing on rail service, and multi-day hearings on restoring Amtrak service uh, to the, along the Gulf Coast. The board has also issued notices of proposed rulemaking for a number of different issues. The board has also continued to attempt to address the supply chain crisis, review mergers, and engage in other regulatory activities. Mr. Chairman, how does the level of activity for the current STB compare to the past boards? Well, th thank you for that question. First of all, Congressman, I'm really happy to see somebody here from Illinois. Makes me feel a little more at home. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I, I didn't grow up too far from you. I grew up in Springfield, so. Yeah, you just know, you're, you're way north in the state. <laughs> well, my, my father used to say we grew up on the far south side of Chicago. It's true. Uh, the, um, uh, this has been an extraordinarily busy time at the board. Probably, you know, I've only been there three years, but we have a lot of people who've been there for a while. Uh, and uh, we probably have never been this busy in the last 20 years. Um, a, a, a lot of it were some actions started by my predecessor, which we need to fulfill. And of course, there were any, many issues that were brought to us, such as the pending merger between uh, Canadian Pacific, Kansas City Southern, the Gulf Coast case, which is unprecedented. It's the first time that statute's been tried. The whole supply chain meltdown. Uh, these are all landed on our plate at the same time. And, and I have to say uh, that our staff, which is relatively small for a government agency, first of all, it's a highly qualified and dedicated staff. And we have churned out an amazing amount of work. So I know people get frustrated with the fact that it takes us a long time, but let me just take the opportunity to tell you that uh, with only 117 FTEs on staff now, and we are in the process of intense hiring efforts, last year the board issued 474 decisions, and these are often lengthy, lengthy decisions. 339 of those were staff dis written decisions from our director's office. And our OPEGAC office, which handles uh, relationships with Congress, but also relationships with the shipping world and our stakeholders handled almost 1,400 matters that came in with a relatively small number of people. So we have, I think, risen to the occasion. Uh, I think we're all working ex extremely hard, uh, and I think we're meeting, meeting the challenge. Uh, but I appreciate the question because it has been a very busy time. Well, my second question was one I was going to ask, uh, was asked for by the ranking member before he left, and you did a so I've got that answer, but my third was this. You know, last month the board held a two-day hearing to discuss issues for in rail service. You know, during that hearing, railroads admitted that service had not been at the level the customers expected. You know, these descriptions, uh, disruptions have been uh, severely felt by my constituents in the agricultural industry. And I don't believe that we can simply regulate our way out of the problem, but we can find a solution. Will the STB commit to working with all stakeholders to address service issues and work to ensure that both rail carriers and shippers have a balance in that decision? We will because we always do, Congressman. And I will say it is a big step in the right direction. And one of the reasons to hold public hearings, and of course I don't have to tell the Congress about that, is to force these issues out in the open. And I think it was a big step in the right direction that the railroads did not come in and try to pretend that there was no problem. Right. They often have in the past, but they really couldn't deny the facts that were in front of us. I, I agree, and I think there's a, there's a lot of work to be done, and I think that uh, every answer that you've given today says that you're willing to do that work, and uh, I appreciate you being here today, and with that, I yield back. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, gentleman yields back. We'll now hear from the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Carson, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Primus, uh, Commissioner Hedlund. Uh, I'd like to hear from both of you uh, on what additional uh, authorities are needed to limit the time that rail crossings block traffic on public roads. And, and secondly, 
uh, I, I made a request, I made a request in 2018 uh, for more data about this problem, but I haven't received uh, details on the number of locations of incidents since that time. Has, has STB investigated the economic impact of stop trains and extremely long trains for that matter that block crossings and if so, uh, we'd love to be briefed on what you found so far. If not, you investigate the problem. Thank you, Congressman. And again, it's, it's good to see you. Uh, the, the problem of trains stopped at, at, at crossings actually doesn't really fall under, under our, our purview. Uh, it's, it, it's more of, of an FRA-related uh, issue, but it, it, it is, well, I should say the symptoms of it, you know, are something that's concerning to us because we believe because uh, the railroads are building longer and longer trains, uh, I, I think that lends itself to, to, uh, to why you're seeing uh, more train stoppages at, the, at these crossings. Uh, in my time at the board, uh, you know, w w while we've heard it, I don't think we've had any cases come before us or any issues come before us to take a look at it. But I think we can, uh, you know, we look forward to working with FRA as, as they move forward and looking at, at, at the issue and addressing the issue as well. Sometimes the uh, issue of blocked crossings uh, will come up in the context of a merger uh, matter. And I know that that uh, has happened uh, in the past. And so possibly in connection with that kind of proceeding, uh, we can take that into account and ask the railroads what they intend to do about it if there's uh, additional traffic on a certain line. Uh, so I think that's one place where, where, we can, uh, where we can look at it. But to the extent the blocked crossings um, is really a result of this problem that we've talked about several times this morning, which is uh, long trains and uh, inadequate uh, sidings, uh, that's certainly something that we are focused on. I don't know what we can do about it, but it's it's uh, it's endemic. Thank you both commissioners. I yield back, Chairman. Gentleman yields back. We'll now hear from the gentleman from California, Mr. Lamalfa, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, with regard to uh, uh, rail rail shipping here, um, we've had um, some great concerns expressed on the West Coast in California for uh, being able to receive uh, corn and corn byproducts, of, partly for the ethanol uh, industry, ethanol production, which is very important for uh, the fuel mixture we have with, um, I think, up to 10% alcohol or, you know, whether maybe it gets into E15, even A E85. But we have uh, issues with uh, getting the product out there. And so what, what do you see as... Um, you know, I'm told there's labor problems, not enough labor. Is it is it track time? Is it uh, what what is it from the board's perspective? Do you see? And then also want to touch on uh, 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 rail rates too versus versus trucking. Did you say rail rates? Yeah, uh, yes. I, my understanding is that you know rail's always been extremely competitive uh, with trucking, but uh, I have information that says it's uh, actually. Trucking has a shipping advantage these days, and so uh, I, I don't, you know, well, you have uh, to elaborate on that. So, I assume you were directing that at me, kind of. Yes, sir. Yeah, there's, you've covered uh, several very crucial matters in in one question. So let me yeah, try let's, to. Yeah, let's let's yes do the yeah the first. Let part me try that. to parse them out. Among the problems that I am aware of facing uh, California businesses, is, but not unique to California, are one. <clears throat> ethanol plants having to literally shut down production either because they couldn't get raw materials and also one of the most acute problems we heard was that they can't get trains of empty cars to unload the finished product so they can't manufacture more so they have to stop production and that is a problem around the country and it is in my view definitely adding to the escalation in fuel prices because 10 percent of the gasoline is ethanol. Secondly, we had startling reports, which I understand have not totally been resolved, from some major food producers, including poultry producers, 
in California who cannot get their usual load of feed that come in long unit trains. Uh, those problems are directly the result of, not enough, of crews. If you look at the statistics that we collect, uh, of uh, one of the statistics is a train's holding, meaning the train has stopped, it's not moving, either for lack of crews or lack of locomotives. Both of those numbers have been going up through the roof across the boards. So uh, that's what's happening with both ethanol and with the, with the farm mm -hmm. um, matters, that they're just a matter of, uh, of shortages in both areas, locomotives and, and crews. In terms of rates, the, pro the, question, the complaints that I hear about people using trucks rather than, than trains recently are not so much rates, but complete lack of reliability. So you, you have sh major shippers, uh, if you just look at the port problem, uh, that not, not uh, the amount of containers that, you, that move by train, and a fair number do out of the ports, has been re going down, and despite the number of ships sitting out there on the ocean, because some of the major users, the Walmarts, the Home Depots, find it more reliable to ship cross country by truck. At least the truck will get there, and it may be even more expensive. So it's a problem of reliability of service. So I remember Fuchs talked about the first mile, last mile. Can you, can you elaborate on the either lack of locomotives or, or what's going on with the crews? Well, first of all, you need crews to drive the locomotive. Yeah, right, right, right. But secondly, and this, uh, this came out at our hearing. Uh, well, secondly, they mothballed thousands of locomotives. When I say they, all the railroads together. Those, you can't just, it's not like parking your car for a month and you can just start it up. They all need maintenance, re sometimes rehabilitation before a locomotive can re be returned to service. So when we talked about cutting 45,000 workers, that included the electricians and mechanics who they need in the shops to get the locomotives fired up. So that's, that's been a problem on getting more locomotives out on the lines. And then have, they have, have these workers gotten, it. have they gotten other jobs or are they just uh, not uh, coming mm -hmm. out of their COVID caves yet? Oh, I think most of this is beyond the COVID problem. I think that many of these 45,000 people have found other careers yep. and they did not come back. That's really been uh, across the boards. But the, the final problem with locomotives, and this is just shocking to me, um, and we're, we've aimed our recent order at getting to the bottom of this. The railroads, even when they have, so now these very long trains will have three or four locomotives on them because you need that much to move them. But when they're not, many times the train will leave the yard and they will instruct the engineers to turn off one or two of the locomotives just to save fuel. That slows the train down. That congests the system. And or, and or they issue an order, and some of these uh, were presented, uh, Congressman Cohn may be interested, by some of the BN workers. They had presented orders to us from the railroad saying, don't go faster than 40 miles an hour, mm. even if you're on a 70 mile an hour track, Thank you. because it saves fuel. Thank you. Wow. Uh, so it's a combination of all of those problems that are contributing to what you're hearing in California. The gentleman's time is expired. Very devastating to agriculture and our fuel supply. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we will hear from the gentlelady from California, Ms. Napolitano, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, very glad to hear all the, all the discussion of the railroads, but it seems to me that the railroads are not willing to do voluntarily what is necessary or right. Uh, my question, <coughs> pardon me, is regarding the rail investment and profit. Can you share what is the percentage of railroad revenue being reinvested in workers and infrastructure versus the railroad revenue going to investors? And how has this changed over the past 30 years? You know, Congresswoman, it was, the connection was very hard for me to hear the precise nature of the, of the question. I only caught parts of it. Can you share what the percentage of railroad revenue being invested in workers and the infrastructure versus railroad revenue going to investors and how has this changed over the last 30 years? Well, I can't speak with personal knowledge of how it's changed over the last 30 years, but certainly in recent years, we have documented uh, billions and billions of dollars. Uh, I think I gave a speech last fall documenting 
in the last 11 years, about $200 billion in combined stock buy buybacks and dividends going to the owners uh, at the same time. And that the ability for them to make those payments was enabled ent almost entirely by cutting those 45,000 workers, uh, as well as mothballing locomotives. In, in my view, there's some controversy about that, but I think the line is, is pretty direct. And I think our, our view is that the way to change that balance is to, through incentives and regulations, force the railroads to meet higher service standards. I don't think they can do it without employing more workers in locomotives, but the goal is to get the service back. I don't well, know if that was responsive, Congress, but. What can Congress do? Do we have to issue more policy to enable you to be able to hold them accountable? Well, it's a good question. If I had a very specific answer, I would have provided it to the committee already. I think it's a complex <laughs> matter of, of how to consider uh, reining in some of the forces of Wall Street, it's really beyond a railroad question. I think it is a broader economic question. Well, we need to take a look at it anyway. Uh, I have significant concerns over the train length. I've been caught in uh, about 15 to 20 minute wait over what I considered a mile and a half, but it was really more like two and a half miles. And uh, it, uh, I could see the line of cars behind me. They're all spewing fumes waiting to get through. And of course, some of them got out of the line and went back to some other way of getting to their destination. Uh, what is it, is it possible to, uh, and I know the railroad is trying to cut down on the number of employees by doing longer trains and et cetera, but how is that affecting uh, business in uh, terms of uh, delivery? And the sightings are not as uh, prevalent as they should be, or that they haven't gotten as many uh, uh, adequate sightings to uh, uh, be able to take a, the length of trains? Well, right now, we don't have the authority to just order directly to order trains to uh, railroads to limit the length of their trains, or at least I don't think we do. Uh, we do have authority to direct certain service, uh, reliefs of service, but it's never been applied, nor has anybody ever asked, to, asked us to apply it to just shorten a, a train. Uh, it, it is, uh, the railroad operations uh, are, are extraordinarily complex. And if you just try to pick out one problem, such as long trains, uh, you may well have all kinds of unintended consequences. The overall picture, I think, is. Uh, that you raise is a, is a very valid concern. I think that the extremely long trains have complicated the service problems because as has been referred to, they, there are very few places, if any, in the country where the extremely long trains can fit into a siding. And in many, many corridors since all of the merger mania of the 80s and 90s, the railroads have stripped out the double tracking. So there are many long stretches where there's only a single track and when one of these long trains gets on it, they really block every, everything else. Um, and I think it's up to the railroads to reorganize how they launch these trains in order to provide better service because there are places where it definitely does impact service. But it is, it's not just a simple matter saying no train can be longer than X feet uh, it, because everything is involved in a network, so. Uh, I, Thank you I very think, much. Go ahead. I think my colleague, uh, Karen Hedlund, would like to add something, Congressman, if it's okay. Uh, Thank you, uh, Congresswoman. Just one point. The irony is that notwithstanding the fact that there are these long trains blocking crossings, what I have heard is that the Alameda yeah. corridor is running under capacity because not enough, tra not enough, enough trains are going through it. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Um, gentlemen, time has expired. Uh, Thank you. We're next here from... Um, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Nels. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Chairman Oberman, uh, for testifying before the committee, and thank you, uh, all the witnesses, for being here today. Americans are struggling with rampant inflation. The consumer price index is at 8.3% from a year ago. If you go to the grocery store, it's common to see empty shelves, rationing of goods, and out-of-control prices. For God's sake, you have a full-blown baby form formula shortage. Supply chain issues and delays are plaguing almost every form of transportation, 
and leading to increased costs on everyday goods. It doesn't matter what industry, whether it's aviation, trucking, rail, shipping, they are all experiencing delays. All are trying their best to navigate higher costs, labor shortages, unprecedented regulations, massive uncertainty in energy prices. And it wasn't long ago that President Biden and the smart folks of his administration were calling inflation transitory. Yes, transitory. It seems that reality has finally sunk in when on Tuesday the president announced that inflation was his number one domestic issue. Every month there seems to be a new boogeyman for the Biden administration to blame. What I see is a confluence of factors. One week it's COVID, the next it's port delays, it's the war in Ukraine, it's greedy big oil, it's corporate America price gouging. Today the political folks in this administration want to direct their attention and energy toward the greedy class one railroads. Never, never does this administration nor this president look at themselves in the mirror and take any accountability for the problems they have largely created. And Mr. Chairman, I want to ask you, but you talk a lot about the, the labor shortages in the rail industry, and, and in your testimony, it's the rail industry has contributed to this worsening working conditions and insufficient incentives. I say it's a sad state of affairs. It's every industry. It's sad that job creators in this country, no matter what industry, is competing with the federal government to get their people back to work. And when you look at salaries, I, th I think about salaries. Do you know what the average class one rail employee makes a year? It's about $137,000. I know Biden's inflation is bad, $137,000 sounds like a pretty good salary to me. Do you know what percentage of the employees are unionized for class one railroads? It's 84%. So are you saying that the industry with 84% unionization rate and an average salary of $137,000 has insufficient incentives to attract talent? I do. I do because those are the facts that are presented with us, to us. And I would only comment not to get into a broader political discussion because that's beyond my uh, role for being here today, that and I can't comment on other industries because that's not what I've been asked to work on. But I can tell you the problems in the railroad industry are self-inflicted. Unlike almost other, I'm not aware of any other industries which has cut 30% of its workforce. And that began long before President Biden took office. It began actually when President Obama was in office and continued all through the Trump administration. And I don't see any of those administrations had anything to do with it. It was the railroads themselves that made those choices. And I can tell you that at the hearings we had two weeks ago, the railroads came in and proudly proclaimed that they were trying to hire new conductors at $52,000 a year, not 137. And when I asked them how they were gonna compete with Walmart hiring truck drivers at $110,000, they didn't have an answer. So that's all I can add to this. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, you've answered my question. I yield back. Gentleman yields back, and we'll now hear from the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Payne and Mr. Oberman. You nailed it, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Rep the, uh, Representative Nelms' uh, question. Uh, and thank you, uh, all of the witnesses, for being here, and also thank you so much for the work that you all do. Railroads provide efficient transportation of goods and people they have one of the lowest carbon footprints among transportation options, and they have historically provided stable, well-paid union jobs. But today, cost-cutting strategies promoted by vulture capitalists on Wall Street have downsized railroad operations to the most basic options. And as a result, industries that depend on railroads from agriculture to animal welfare to passenger rail are less resilient and robust. What's more, the lack of reliability of railroads has led freight traffic to rely more on trucks than rail, exacerbating emissions and also our looming climate crisis. And while the hardworking team at the STB is taking these issues seriously, Congress must help to ensure that the STB has the tools that it needs to conduct 
effective oversight and to address concerns. Now, uh, Mr. Oberman, uh, animal welfare requires high quality rail services. Delayed trains and scarce rail cars are impeding crop shipments this spring. In fact, as noted in a letter from the USDA to STB, communications from industry suggest that some livestock operations face potential starvation for their animals. These disruptions pose critical threats to the American agriculture industry broadly, the livelihoods of our farmers and ranchers and the lives of countless animals if the potential required killing of herds of animals is not addressed. Uh, Chairman Oberman, you were quoted as saying that farmers have been hours away from depopulating herds. Will herds of animals be prematurely slaughtered because of delayed grain shipments to producers? I think we've come close to that, Congressman, based on reports of, I have heard, but so far it hasn't happened. I would say that we have one, uh, I think, very strong tool to immediately deal with these problems, and we have made it even stronger in our proposal uh, of a couple of weeks ago uh, to provide more emergency relief. So in just the situation that you referred to, where a, uh, a, a livestock producer, ch a chicken or farm or, or cattle farm, uh, can't get the feed train delivered, uh, we, we are proposing to make it much easier for those customers to come in and get an emergency order from us within a, a two, uh, I can't remember the time period, but two or three days, uh, very quickly for us to order a, a railroad to deliver the needed feed trains that are, that are not getting delivered. So that, that's the concept behind this one rule that we propose that we put out a very short comment period, so hopefully we can act on it within the next, um, I think at this point, about three or four weeks away uh, uh, to being able to put that into place. Although we have an emergency service rule now that shippers can use, and I have been told uh, that there have been several instances in the last couple of weeks where shippers were on the verge of filing an emergency petition with us and the threat of it uh, resulted in the railroads uh, saying, okay, we'll deliver the trains. So sometimes we act more effectively by just being there and knowing that we're not afraid to act. And this board is not afraid to act. Well, thank you for that. Typically, the STB regulates the rail industry over long time horizons, but what can the STB do immediately when a true emergency arises, such as when huge numbers of livestock and livelihoods are at risk uh, uh, in addition to uh, what you just talked about? Well, that is our, our uh, primary tool uh, for the immediate solution of these problems. But I think the order we issued uh, last week after our hearing requiring uh, immediate uh, filing of, of service recovery plans and reporting on first mile, last mile service so we can uh, publicize this, among other things, is going to I think bring the railroads, uh, I, I hope, uh, to a more accountable situation. Uh, they know the spotlight is on them. This hearing helps. Our hearings help. Uh, and, uh, you know, the message has gone out. You know, it was interesting. Uh, Congressman DeFazio quoted Matt Rose's speech from about four years ago, who told the railroads that they really needed to shape up if they didn't want the Congress and the STB running their businesses. And I think it's taken them several years to get the message, and I'm hoping they've finally gotten it. Thank you. My time has expired, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. We'll now hear from gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Balderson, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Chairman Oberman. Thank you for being here today. Uh, my first question, Chairman, is you note that the board has statutory authority to order a freight railroad to allow the operation of additional Amtrak trains over its line. And the board is currently completing a proceeding to you by Amtrak, which is requesting access to freight lines along the Gulf Coast. When considering whether to order a freight railroad to allow the operation of Amtrak trains over its line, does the board consider potential disruptions this may cause to freight rail networks? Very good question, Congressman, and I have to answer it in generalities because, as you said, we are in the middle of a contested hearing on just this question. 
Uh, and in fact, whenever we get released from here, we will be going back into that hearing at, at uh, our office down the street. Uh, the statute that we operate under, which has never been implemented in the last 50 years, but is the issue in this case, and I think the issue in the situation you're referring to, provides that we shall order the Amtrak service onto a rail line. However, we must take into consideration, quote, unreasonable impairment of freight service. So the Congress has mandated us to do exactly what you just asked, and we are doing it. Uh, and uh, yes, it is very important to make sure that Amtrak and the freight railroads run cooperatively and fl fluidly, and there is a constant tension there, which is what we were set up to, to moderate. Uh, so we, we do, cons I think the direct answer to your question is yes, we consider in interference with freight. Okay, thank you. Um, I had kind of a follow up on that, but you, you pretty much answered that for the process. Um, I'd like to follow up on some questions I asked to representatives of the rail industry and shippers during a subcommittee hearing on March 8. Does the Tr Surface Transportation Board have any concerns that proposed changes uh, to the reciprocal switching could impact future investments by the railroads into their own infrastructure? Well, I hear that uh, concern from the railroads. Uh, it's not one that, speaking for myself, I would ignore. I think it is vastly overstated. Um, the, uh, what came out at the hearing were, uh, was the exploration, uh, led somewhat by me, but I think all of us were interested in, is how to implement a loosened, uh, somewhat loosened reciprocal switching rule that would provide necessary relief and more competition uh, uh, to the industry uh, with minimizing uh, disruption of cu current freight. You know, the railroads constantly say the STB should keep our noses out of it and let the market decide. And I have one, many answers, but my usual answer is, I believe in letting the market decide, but for the market to decide, there has to be a market. And in many, many parts of this country, there simply is no market. Ship, shippers are captive to one railroad, and that's what the reciprocal switching concept is aimed at. Thank you for that answer. Uh, I appreciate your time. Mr. Chairman, I yield back my remaining time. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, yields back. Uh, we will now hear from the gentlelady from Nevada, Ms. Titus, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank the witnesses for being here. I was very interested in that last question because we are trying to get Amtrak restored between Las Vegas and Los Angeles, and we're, we're having trouble uh, dealing with the private railroads and the use of some of the lines and things, and because we have to import everything to Las Vegas, whether it's flowers or lobsters or whatever, we've got to have that freight uh, operating effectively. So I'm curious to learn more. We can do this offline about the interaction between Amtrak and uh, the freight lines in, in that part of the country, not just in Florida. I, I wanted to ask you, or let me just say first, used to be that uh, the trains were the good guys and not the truckers. Uh, they had less pollution. They didn't tear up the roads. They respected unions. They had more safety and they were better for climate change. We see the truck industry instead, they lack drivers, but uh, what they want to do is hire people who are 18 years old not have rest periods. Uh, they don't recognize many unions, some of these uh, trucking companies, and they tear up the roads and they don't pay their fair share to help to fix them. Now it seems like railroads are trying to go in the same direction as trucking, and I don't think that's a very good example to follow. So I'm like you, I hope they're hearing this and kind of reform their ways. Uh, I guess I would ask you if you could talk a little bit about what might have been available through the CARES Act or some of the recovery bills or even the infrastructure, bipartisan infrastructure bill that went to maybe help railroads. I know there was money there for workers who were laid off maybe to get unemployment, but was there anything in there that you see as making perhaps an improvement or a difference in the way railroads operate if they can access 
some of this money either directly or indirectly through some of the investments in infrastructure? Congressman, let me say a couple of things quickly in response to what you said. And if you don't mind, I'm going to then shift over to Member Headland, you know, who spent a number of years at the FRA in, and has a lot more knowledge about the government handing out money to railroads than I do. And, and um, I think she could give you a more fulsome answer. I will say that um, uh, that w we are uh, very conscious of of our obligation under the statutes um, when it, with regard to Amtrak and its service. And I'm sure you know, by the way, you didn't mention it, and I can't much talk about it because it's pending, that there is a pending proceeding before us to establish a high-speed passenger rail line between Las Vegas and mm -hmm. Los Angeles. Which, yes. Which should provide, uh, I would think, some great boon to uh, the Las Vegas economy once uh, that gets built, assuming it does get built. Uh, I wanted to get built, and I want you to speed that up. We've been working on it 40 years. It's time to build that speed train. You know what? We we have acted on every one of the matters that have come before us on that thing since I've been on the board pretty quickly. Uh, it's really the people who are building it who are, uh, you know, we're waiting for them as well. I guess that's all I can say at this point. I'll, I'll, Let me switch I'll it over. I'll pass that word on to them. Thank you, sir. Pardon? I didn't hear that. Uh, oh, I just okay. said I will pass the word on to them. Oh, the yes, please do. Governors. Anyway, if you don't mind, I'd like to switch this over no. to Member Hedlund. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Congresswoman uh, Titus. Um, the uh, money that's been made available uh, in the IHAA for railroads, uh, a total of $66 billion, a good share of that is going to go into the Northeast Corridor, which is... Uh, owned by Amtrak, used by commuter rail, and also by Conrail. Uh, but the majority of it will probably wind up uh, going into investments in our existing freight railroads for the benefit of passenger rail. And that was also the case with the Recovery Act uh, when I was uh, at the uh, Department of Transportation. Uh, and uh, without question, although these investments will be made for the benefit of passenger rail, and I'm sure the FRA and the department will require uh, agreements between uh, the state sponsors and uh, or grantees uh, and the railroads that they guarantee that those investments will yield whatever the objective of the, the project is, whether it's additional round trips or uh, reduced travel time, that they will guarantee that. Uh, but those, those investments inevitably also benefit the railroads themselves. Uh, if you build uh, additional or longer sidings, uh, it also is going to benefit the freights because it means that uh, two long trains can pass each other, not just that uh, a long train can allow Amtrak to pass. Thank so you. I think uh, there is a great deal of money available. It's up to the Department of Transportation Thank to you. decide where that goes. But my observation would be that it's going to benefit more than just passenger rail. Thank you. Very much. Thank you, General. Mr. Chairman. General Lee's time has expired. Uh, we will now go to uh, Mr. Johnson of South Dakota. Thank you, Chairman Payne. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you noted in your testimony uh, some concern and critique of the railroad's uh, layoffs. I think you noted that they'd reduced their labor force by 29% in the preceding six years. I think some 45,000 jobs. When you have raised this issue with the class ones, what what response do they give you? I just want to put some further context onto this issue. You know, Congressman, I've never heard a response that made any sense, so it's very hard for me to articulate their position. Uh, but uh, and I have asked, and in fact, we are. Uh, I am hoping to shed some light on this in our uh, requirement that they give us recovery plans. I have asked repeatedly if of the class one executives, when I've either met with them in public or at our hearings, do you have any plans to restore any of any portion of those 45,000 jobs? I've never suggested they should hire all of those positions back, but it's quite clear to me that they don't have a cushion. As I have said many times, you wouldn't send a football team out on the field without a backup quarterback. But what the railroads have done is just that. They have set 
the rail crew levels at levels where they have no backup. So when there was COVID, when there's a, a vortex, when there's any disruption of workers getting to the job, the trains stop running. Uh, their attitude so far has been, well, we're just trying to fill the holes we have now. If, if you look at their employment levels over the last two years, they have barely managed to increase the levels they had after they made the additional 20% cut in labor at the beginning of the pandemic. So they don't give me an answer, uh, or at least so, one and, that I could articulate. And I assume when we're talking about not hiring back, I mean, I suppose we should probably look at these workforce adjustments in two ways. I mean, one would be the 45,000 you're talking about over six years, let's call those uh, efficiency focused reductions. And then you've got the furloughs that were done during COVID, which I think probably would have been more market conditions, volume driven. I mean, I assume they've recovered the uh, workforce levels coming out of COVID by and large. They have not. That's really why we're having the problem. Uh, and I wouldn't call those 45,000 efficiency reductions. They call them that. Uh, but it is not efficient when you get to a workforce that is so low without a backup that the trains stop running. And we were having a lot of service complaints before COVID. They have been greatly exacerbated since COVID. And I, I think what was a foolish business decision, and I've said so, and I, I will say it again, is that when COVID hit in March of 2020, no one knew how long it was gonna last. Was it a month, a 10 year program, or somewhere in between? And no one knew when freight rail demand would come back. And remember, when you lay off an experienced engineer or conductor, and there's no assurance they'll come back, and most of the, many of them did not, they went into other industries, to replace that person under FRA restrictions and just general common sense requires six months of training. So you make a, a precipitous business decision that I'm gonna cut 20% of my workforce, which is what most of the class ones did between March and June of 2020, not knowing when you're gonna need them back, but when you do need them, you're at least six months away, assuming you can find them. So these were, were really irresponsible business decisions in my view, and it is why we are suffering to today and why they cannot restore enough workers to even, as the other Congressman was saying, to get feed trains to chicken farms. They just can't do it in every situation. Yeah, I mean, Mr. Chairman, I mean, it's my understanding that in general after furloughs, 90% of those uh, workers return in short order. Now that has been, my understanding, that has not been the case in this situation. It's been closer to 65 or 70%. Uh, might it, uh, I mean, use the word irresponsible. I mean, given that 90% normally return is that description a bit harsh on, on your part? I mean, were they operating under reasonable assumptions given history? I don't think so, uh, because the pandemic was something new. Uh, no one could predict the future. I'm not aware of that figure of 90%, and I don't know that it's 65% now. I know that the real labor have shown me statistics where hundreds of people are leaving voluntarily now because of working conditions. And I think that was a disincentive to people coming back. One of the things that happened in late 2020 and 21 is that they would bring workers back from furlough for a month, then they'd furlough them again. And a number of workers have told me and union leaders have said, you know, that after bouncing back and forth once or twice, it was such a hardship on their families that many people just walked out the door. So I think My it was- My time has expired, I don't think sir. Thank you for your comment. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I'd like to thank the gentleman for yielding back. Uh, we next have a gentleman from California, Mr. Hoffman, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me thank uh, Chair Oberman and the members of the Service Transportation Board for being with us here today. This is uh, very enlightening. Uh, I'd like to use my time on a, a slightly different subject. I'd like to ask uh, the board about uh, their policies relating to rail banking. Uh, and specifically when there is an abandonment filing uh, pre-coordination for the conversion of a rail line to a trail, and another entity comes along expressing interest in acquisition. Uh, I am curious about the factors that Service Transportation Board applies in considering those situations. Uh, so let, let me start with the local community support. How much weight would the STB give to local community support 
uh, for one of these alternatives over the other in a scenario like that. And you're talking specifically, Congressman, about conversion of an unneeded rail line to a trail use, and, and that, that's correct. Right. Well, we always hear uh, and, and listen very intently to communities. I think there's generally a lot of support on the board. I certainly support the concept of being able to convert uh, rail lines uh, for trail use. It's good for the environment. It's good for the, the local population. Um, and, and I think we generally have been very supportive. Sometimes these requests languish for years and years, and there's a certain point at which we have to to act on them. We have some legal restrictions and some due process property right restrictions. But generally, we are very supportive of, of community input on, on these issues. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. I, I wonder also about um, the financial viability of an entity that might come along and oppose uh, rail banking, suggest that they have an interest in, in reviving uh, a, a functionally abandoned rail line. Uh, how important uh, to your consideration would be would the financial viability uh, of an entity like that be? Uh, you're saying of a line that has been discontinued, but then an entity wants to reinstate it for rail service? Yeah, and is opposing the rail banking alternative. Well, we, we listen to those requests. Uh, you know, we generally ha are mandated by statute to make it easy for rail lines to come into existence. That's one of our jobs. And there's a, uh, I guess, a, a, a spectrum on how much we look at financial viability. Generally speaking, we take the view that the market will determine whether a rail line uh, is viable. Uh, but there have been cases, there was one involving a proposal to build a multi-billion railroad around Chicago, uh, but the applicant only had $150 in the bank. This preceded me. That's an example, an extreme one, where we look at financial viability. But normally- That's very helpful. Yeah. yeah. Thank, normally thank we you. don't. Mr. Chair, and then finally, in, in a situation like that, uh, would you, would, this, would the board uh, require that entity to engage with the community and the public in an open and transparent way? In other words, if they're secretive about who they are, about where their funding comes from, um, is that a factor that you would consider? Well, it's not an issue that's come before us, but I generally believe in full disclosure. And um, uh, when we get those kinds of applications, uh, we have the ability to insist on a more fulsome application of the facts of warrant, which would which would include revealing uh, the basic financial structure of the entity and so forth. So I All think right. the general answer to your question is yes, but I think it's very much case specific. Mr. Chairman, I, I really appreciate that. I, I do uh, believe that where existing rail lines can continue to be used for rail, they should be, and where abandoned lines can be brought back into rail service in a way that makes economic sense and has public support, that should happen too. But I ask these questions because uh, there's a railroad in my district that um, abandoned um, that line through the Eel River Canyon a long time ago. It just cost far too much to operate it. It's fallen into terrible disrepair. And that incumbent railroad and local communities have struck a deal to do something that does make sense to uh, create the 320 mile Great Redwood Trail, uh, the longest continuous rail bank trail in America. Uh, and just as the Surface Transportation Board was considering the application for abandonment, a very shadowy uh, LLC came along uh, to propose uh, an interest in taking it over for a coal export scheme that um, is very unlikely to happen, certainly is at odds with the climate policies expressed by the administration and Secretary Buttigieg. Um, so I just hope that these factors will be on your mind as you discharge your responsibility and very much Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, we will now hear from um, Ms. Steele of California for five minutes. Okay. Uh, we will move. We will move. Um, 
Next, we will hear from the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, for five minutes. Well, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the board members for attending and helping the committee with its work. <clears throat> I do want to correct the record. Uh, so uh, there was an earlier statement by one of my colleagues that uh, real, the average rail worker earned about 137000 a year. I just about fell out of my chair. I was going to go apply. But uh, I, I, so I, we're having trouble getting rail workers in Massachusetts because we, as, as the chair has mentioned, we lost, and one of my colleagues on the Republican side mentioned, we lost 45,000 rail workers um, over the past few years. Uh, but according to uh, salary.com, it lists the salary as between uh, 48,000 and 80,000. The average salary is about 64,000. Uh, electrical engineers obviously get paid on the higher end. Uh, ZipRecruiter as well lists a salary between 24,000 and 60,000. And uh, salary, actually, uh, it comes out to uh, between uh, $18 an hour and $28 an hour. So that's what they're making. And the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which does this for a living, uh, reports that the average salary is $64,150 a year. So uh, just wanted to uh, disabuse anyone of that notion that they're making on more than double that. Uh, so we have a, I met with the, uh, the Brotherhood of uh, Labor, uh, I'm sorry, the BLE, the Brotherhood of uh, Locomotive Engineers Teamsters uh, the other night, and they've told me that they've been two years without a contract and uh, that they were having trouble holding on to people because, you know, most people can't go a couple of years and it may be, it may be a couple more years before they ever see a, uh, a raise. And I'm just, you know, I see there's a need for workers and 64,000 is, is okay. We should be able to attract people at that salary. I wish it was more, but, uh, and, and we see the services going down. And I'm just uh, it's sort of a paradox where we need workers at a decent salary, and yet we can't seem to uh, get a collective bargaining agreement for any of these rail unions. They've all been without a contract for a couple of years. And I'm just curious if, if any of the members there have any uh, sense of what is causing that uh, reluctance on the part of the, uh, the, the carriers, the uh, rail companies to come to the table and work out a, an agreeable solution? Well, it's a, it's a question of the hour, I think, Congressman. And uh, I didn't want to contradict the other Congressman. There's a lot of overtime in the rail industry, and there are some workers who make- not enough workers. Yeah, who make 137,000. I didn't have the average numbers at hand. I'm glad you, you offered them, but I, I didn't think he was on target, but I wasn't sure I was calculating it. You know, we don't have jurisdiction over the rail labor contracting, and of course there is a national bargaining session going on as we speak, uh, and then there's an entire statutory provision that you all have created many decades ago for presidential emergency boards and so forth. Um, and I, I'm not enough of a labor expert to tell you whether that's a help or a hindrance to their reaching a, a contract. Uh, but I think we have seen a general trend where the rail, railroads have been They've been not spending enough money on, on their workforces. But what I hear... I, I do want to, if you're not going to, if you don't have a ready answer, I'd rather uh, move on. Sure. Uh, Mr. Primus, it is good to see you. It has been a while, but it's good to see you doing well. Uh, I know you had comments in the press a while ago about the uh, diminution of service and the extension of the delays. Some, some companies are saying that uh, their delays, uh, their, their delivery times are increased by 15 to 20 percent. I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about the long-term impacts of that on the supply chain and of cost to consumers. Uh, yes, I do, and it's good to see the delegation represented here this morning. Uh, on your, your previous question, I'll just say this also. Uh, you can see uh, the attention that the railroads have given to labor when you look at how much they've cut the labor force and, and how much they're, they're not uh, respecting and, and looking out for their best interests. You can see that. And they're giving more money to their shareholders. There hasn't been one major bonus or, or pay raise in those years, those couple years that they've been working us out of COVID. 
and getting folks back on. No, no hit hint towards that. With respect to service, absolutely. Service degradation is the reason why we're paying more in food prices. Uh, it's a reason why we're seeing uh, uh, increases, even though it dropped last month, uh, increases in, in gas prices. You're gonna see problems uh, in these power plants, these coal-fired power plants. They're not getting uh, uh, coal. Uh, you can see it in water treatment plants. They're not getting the chemicals to treat the water. So yes, I mean, service is, is going directly to the consumers. It's affecting and, and hurting the consumers, not just in the pocketbook, but also uh, um, within, with their health and with their safety. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you for your courtesy. The gentleman yields back. Now here from my good friend, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, my good friend, the chairman. It's great to see you, my friend. I appreciate uh, being able to walk right into the hearing and come up next in questions. <laughs> uh, what a coincidence, or the chairman's given me some preference, but I would say it's probably more a coincidence, sir. Um, great to see uh, the members here today, the board. We appreciate the opportunity to hear from you. Uh, I'm actually the lead Republican on the House Administration Committee here in Congress. And the issue I'm going to bring up today relates more to some of the issues we've been facing there, but they impact, uh, they impact many of the, the issues that we talked about today. I, I've had discussions with folks in the election space who have serious concerns with a paper shortage in the upcoming elections. Most recently, I convened a roundtable discussion on this topic to hear from stakeholders about the critical need to use paper for ballots and for other election materials. I'm committed to helping broker a solution for these concerns to ensure that elections officials have the materials they need. As you know, several commodities are exempt from STB oversight, including forest products and paper. I understand the STB is considered revoking some or all of the commodity exemptions for a decade now. I'll start with you, Mr. Oberman, the home state guy. Um, do you have any updates on the STB's consideration of these exemptions? Thank you, Congressman. I think the last time I was in your office, I was chairman of Metro, and look what happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the answer is that we have a pending uh, rule change to lift those exemptions. And it has taken a long time because the uh, industry wanted us to consider a, a much more uh, sort of an economic analysis of, of how we've done it. We thought we had a solution and it turned out not, not to be one. So th that rule is still pending. But I will say uh, that we have the ability to lift an exemption for purposes of a specific case. We just did that in a, in a pending matter involving a different kind of commodity. Um, and I had heard uh, when I first joined the board, a number of complaints from the uh, uh, forest, forestry industry, the paper industry, about a lack of service and demarketing by railroads. But I have to say, I've not heard such complaint recently. But if there are such concerns, those shippers can come to us right now and ask us for relief and also to lift the exemption for the purpose of that proceeding. And it's something that we would listen to, and they won't have to wait for the overall rule if they have a, a, a valid complaint for, uh, for lack of service. So if, if that is going on, and I'm not aware of it, but I hope that you will encourage those folks to come to bring it to our attention immediately and we'll try to deal with the problem. Well, I, I certainly will, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to hear that update. Uh, the election and having faith in our election systems, is, is, it's too important to be disrupted by a, a product shortage that if we can address together, um, we can make sure that that does not happen. Anybody else up at the dais have any comments on this? I, I would say, by the way, based on the cases we're hearing right now, there doesn't seem to be a shortage of paper. You ought to see the paper that the lawyers are, are filing with us. Well, you know, and I, I, I asked the same question when we had a round table, but it's a certain type of paper that's not being produced as much by producers that are required for election administrators and election equipment to operate effectively. Um, and that's what's concerning to us. So I, I appreciate being able to have the ability to have, uh, to work with you all to see if there is a, is a problem remaining as we move closer to the elections this year that we can work in a, in a, in a very collaborative way to make sure that doesn't happen. Did, I, I don't see your name tag on the end, I apologize. Right, I'm, I'm also originally from Illinois. Oh, great, <laughs> um, where at? Uh, the south side of Chicago. Oh, 
Okay, well, you know, I'm really far south side of Chicago. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, this is stunning what you said. Um, you know, as I expressed earlier, um, we're worried about world famine, and now you're telling us we should be worrying about saving our democracy. Well, and, and that's why we wanted to have the roundtable with the producers and, and ensure that our election administrators, election equipment providers ha had a voice and to really offer concerns. And, and my main concern in bringing this up here today is really to be able, to, again, to collaborate with the STB if we see that that shortage actually happens. Now, hopefully it won't. Hopefully the problem bringing it to the attention of producers months ago may have corrected it. And, and I certainly hope so, but it is something that I, I think the STB needs to be concerned about, and, and I'll, I'll let you know what we hear based on the feedback from Mr. Oberman. So thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back, and we now hear from the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Garcia, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman uh, Payne and Chair DeFazio for holding uh, this hearing, and uh, thank you to the STB board for appearing today. I, of course, uh, want to recognize uh, my uh, friend and STB uh, Chairman Marty Overman, uh, who's here today. Uh, Marty and I, of course, uh, served together in the Chicago City Council during uh, a very tumultuous period, uh, but also historic. So great to see you, um, Marty. Uh, since, uh, 19, since 2015, the Class 1 railroads uh, have reduced the workforce by 29%, resulting in tens of thousands of job losses, of course. It's clear from the recent hearings that the Surface Transportation Board had on freight rail service that these cuts have resulted in the Class 1 railroads unable to provide the level or quality of rail service that we need. I strongly support Chair Oberman and the Surface Transportation Board's plans to implement regulations and policies that will address the negative consequences that these job cuts have had on railroads, its workers, Amtrak, and shippers. Uh, Chair uh, Oberman, um, the uh, railroad, uh, certain rail shippers uh, complain of railroad demarketing, meaning that railroads are refusing to serve them or are placing onerous conditions on, on service because the railroads feel that these shippers cannot uh, be served at the railroad's desired profit margin. Do you believe that this is happening? And if so, do you believe that such practices are consistent with the common carrier obligation? Excellent question, Congressman, and you're the only Congressman I can call Chewy, so I will. Uh, <laughs> Thank started, you. We started life together, uh, political life. Uh, there is little doubt in my mind, based on a large number of uh, anecdotal reports and some data, that the railroads have been engaged in uh, the Class Ones in demarketing uh, for a number of, of years. And if you look at the uh, statistics about car loads and uh, growth or lack thereof, you will see that over the last decade and a half or so, as the economy has grown substantially, car loads on railroads have not, which is, means there's an, a negative impact on marketing uh, many kinds of commodities which ought to be on rail, but which are not as profitable as some others until the railroads have uh, assiduously uh, I tried to avoid that kind of business because it doesn't make their numbers look as good for their stock prices. Um, I do think it, uh, a demarketing effort by a railroad, if it can be proven, does implicate the common carrier obligation, and it, and it is something that uh, we, we have the current authority to look at. You know, part of the problem is getting uh, these affected shippers to bring their complaints to us on a case-by-case -case basis. They're expensive, they're time consuming, and a lot of uh, shippers, I think, who are demarketed just find it easier to move their stuff on truck rather than engage in complex litigation. But it is one of the areas, just thinking back to Chairman DeFazio's inquiry about the common carrier obligation, that I, I would love to be able to explore in more detail and see if we can't come up with a way to counter the incentives for demarketing. But it is a, definitely a real phenomenon, Chewy. Yes, sir. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, another question. Uh, commuter railroads currently have very limited abilities to bring cases before the Surface Transportation Board when it comes to matters like negotiations with freight railroads uh, on adding service or uh, um, 
resolving time performance uh, issues. As Congress considers reauthorization of uh, BSTB, do you believe that strengthening the ability for commuter railroads to bring these matters before the Surface Transportation Board would help resolve some of these important issues? I do. You know, I, I can look at this from both sides of that aisle because I had the experience at a commuter railroad of having to interact with the class ones and generally Metra had good relationships with class ones, but there were points of, of contest. But we are well suited, I think, to manage those kinds of relationships because we already are assigned to manage the interrelationships between passenger rail on Amtrak that Amtrak provides and freight rail. And while commuter rail is different from long, certainly from long distance or inner city Amtrak service, the concepts of being cognizant of making sure that rail service functions fluidly while still providing uh, passenger service over the same right of way is one that we are very experienced with. And I've been asked about that. I don't think we need to lobby for more duties because we are filled up. But if the Congress wanted to ask this board to be in the position to mediate some of those relationships, I think we would be a suitable place to do it. Okay. Thank Thanks you. so much, uh, Marty. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, the gentleman yields back. We'll now hear from the gentlelady from California, Ms. Steele, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for the witness, Mr. Oberman. Significant disru uh, disruptions to our nation's supply chain had an, have had a ripple effect, hitting American families in their wallets as inflation continues its grip on our nation. Burdensome regulatory efforts can impose significant operational disruptions on the freight transportation sector. A recent proposal by the board, which would require railroads to turn over traffic to competitors, would ultimately increase the complexity of moves, decrease network fluidity, and exacerbate current difficulties within supply chains at a time when the federal government is investing significant resources in identifying and addressing issues that disrupt supply chains, it seems counterintuitive to pursue regulatory policies that could further slow down the flow of goods. Mr. Oberman, will you commit to ensuring that the board fully considers the impact of these proposals on the functioning of supply chain before taking any action? Congressman, thank you for the question. We are in the process of doing just that. Uh, and uh, we always uh, consider, because it's our job, the impact of what we do on freight rail operations. But I will just repeat what I alluded to earlier, and that is for the, at currently, the supply chain has been so bollocked up by the railroads that anything we could do, I think, would only improve the situation, and that's what we're trying to, to do before we act. Thank you for your commitment. As it relates to the supply chain crisis, can you share with the committee all of the data and evidence you have asserting that freight rail service has solely become both inconsistent and unreliable? All the data we have is at your uh, command, Congressman, and I, I think we do supply the committee now with, with anything that you've asked for, but we're happy to do it. The more of sunshine we can shed on this situation, the better. I really appreciate that, your answer. And uh, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, the gentlelady yields back. Uh, that concludes the um, questions that we have from members. Um, and the hearing today. I'd like to, again, thank each of the witnesses for your testimony uh, today. And I ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses have provided answers to any questions that may be submitted to them in writing. Uh, I also ask unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for any additional comments and information submitted uh, by members or witnesses to be included 
in the record for today's hearing. Without objection, so order. Uh, this subcommittee stands adjourned. <laughs>